Hello everyone and welcome you all for today's lecture. Uh, we will uh, briefly look at what we did last time uh, and uh, then proceed further for the other aspects of uh, asymmetric reactions. So last time what we discussed was uh, Katsuki uh, Jacobson epoxidation and uh, the mechanistic aspects of it towards the end and followed by uh, we did uh, introduction of the uh, uh, dihydroxylation of olefins. So in the case of Katsuki epoxidation reactions various aspects of it we saw how the uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, C2 symmetric based uh, 1 to diamines and different uh, aldehydes which are basically salicylaldehyde derivatives are used to make the uh, manganese oxo complex and that allows epoxidation to take place based on various factors and then allows uh, highly enantioselective epoxidation. In that respect when we uh, looked at the mechanism if we start with a cis olefin then we saw that there could be a possibility of a manganese uh, uh, complex uh, which is basically uh, having a 2 plus 1 type of uh, intermediate. Uh, that means it gives you a 2 plus 1 concerted process to lead to this which allows the uh, epoxidation to complete by the release of manganese 3. So uh, we start with manganese 5 and then we release the manganese 3 upon epoxidation. We also saw that uh, since cis uh, olefin gives uh, cis epoxide uh, therefore this type of concerted process is important. Uh, we also saw that uh, it can also be uh, done uh, by a, a metallo-oxetane type of intermediate uh, where something of this kind can be proposed and when uh, this uh, breaks up in this fashion then we can also expect the uh, cis epoxidation to take place and plus of course manganese uh, catalyst goes away. But this was also uh, expected uh, to uh, form uh, a sort of uh, radical in uh, some way or the other so that we can expect that there is a possibility of a radical formation here and of course a radical can come in here and then there is a rotation and then that can allow the uh, epoxidation eventually to form in this way that some amount of trans epoxide is formed. So considering these aspects um, uh, there is a possibility of uh, such a radical based uh, reaction to occur especially in cases where the cyclopropane ring becomes uh, a part of uh, the starting material. So these are the aspects that we saw and then we also looked at the uh, dihydroxylation of olefins uh, using osmium tetroxide. But since osmium tetroxide is uh, expensive and uh, toxic uh, and therefore uh, there is a need to um, use that in a catalytic amount and uh, towards the end we looked at uh, the use of co-oxidants and uh, where we discussed sodium chlorate and also hydrogen peroxide but then these lead to over oxidation. Uh, so there was a problem and therefore there is a need to, um, uh, to look at the, the uh, co-oxidants in a different way. So later on uh, uh, Sharpless also uh, did some work in this area and many other people and accordingly Sharpless introduced uh, the uh, tertiary butyl hydroperoxide along with the osmium tetroxide as a co-oxidant and in the presence of uh, these salts to, uh, to kind of dissolve the reactant and the aqueous condition. And also N-methyl uh, morpholine anoxide uh, NMO was used as a co-oxidant uh, by uh, Upjohn company and that is why it is known as Upjohn dihydroxylation. 
uh, because it was uh, they who first developed uh, the use of uh, N-methylmorpholine N oxide uh, in the diadoxylation. So this is the uh, this uh, NMO that is N-methylmorpholine N oxide, uh, which is uh, what is uh, something that we had discussed earlier. And uh, one of the first uh, uh, attempts to make it uh, chiral was then looked at it because now since osmium tetroxide is not required in a, a stoichiometric fashion and therefore uh, one can now start looking at whether uh, reaction can be made it as a catalytic uh, and also uh, asymmetric. Now we mentioned uh, or we discussed earlier that there was a possibility of uh, increasing the rate of reaction and increase the yield if uh, a uh, tertiary amine or a pyridine is added uh, to the reaction mixture and that allows the uh, uh, attachment of the triethyl I mean the tertiary amine or the pyridine to the osmium uh, atom and therefore the reaction rate increases. Considering that uh, the chiral ligand which is uh, pyridine based was uh, used for the first time and it was found that eventually the, there was an uh, optical uh, kind of induction or asymmetric induction and that gave uh, the uh, optically active molecules in 3 to 18 percent enantiomeric purity. Uh, however, uh, this particular chiral ligand which is uh, is this where there are three asymmetric centers and uh, it was found that since pyridine moiety is very close to the isopropyl group and therefore it is uh, something could be um, uh, sterically uh, not uh, desirable and uh, therefore the large group uh, close to the nitrogen uh, uh, sort of prevents the pyridine uh, to come very close to the osmium because of the steric hindrance. Later on um, uh, many people like Narasaka, Sinder, Hirama and Kori uh, studied different types of uh, C2 symmetric based uh, bidented amine ligands such, uh, which are shown here and uh, different types of uh, these ligands gave very high energy selectivity more than 99 percent for transtilbene, but it was not catalytic in terms of osmium tetroxide or the ligand. That means even these chiral ligands which are shown these uh, structures of which are shown here uh, are need to be used in stoichiometric way and also osmium tetroxide. That is because the bidented these are bidented ligands they get bound to the osmium very very strongly and then they do not come out. So therefore uh, such tightly bound uh, complex uh, although gave very high energy selectivity but then it was not catalytic. Uh, at the same time uh, if we have a loose complex that will also not give high energy uh, meric purity because if it is uh, lose that means it comes off and therefore the reaction will definitely not uh, give high enantiomeric purity because it can also react with uh, unbound osmium tetroxide. So we need to have a compromise. So a compromise has to be reached and in this regard uh, what was found by uh, Sharpless that synchrona alkaloids uh, based ligands uh, along with uh, NMO gave the best results. So NMO was used uh, for um, as a co-oxidant uh, uh, but then synchrona alkaloids were used as chiral ligands. So these are the um, chiral ligands which are used uh, in um, the uh, asymmetric diadoxylation. Uh, one of them is known as dihydroquinidine, the other one is known as dihydroquinine. They are pseudo enantiomers, uh, they are called as pseudo enantiomers, they are not really enantiomers as they are not really uh, up, uh, in the mirror images of each other, but uh, they give uh, different uh, enantioselectivity and therefore 
they are considered as pseudo enantiomers. Now as you can see that the utility of uh, such chiral ligands uh, along with as I mentioned NMO uh, gave the uh, optical purity or enantiomeric purity being 6 to 83 percent and yields ranging from 62 to 90 percent. So uh, it uh, seems to be pretty good but then uh, it is uh, something that we need to worry about it because why is it that the enantiomeric purity is as low as 6 and of course in some cases is as high as 83 percent. Now if we uh, uh, look at one particular example and if we can take this particular uh, trans uh, uh, steel bean then we under these conditions this is the uh, chiral ligand that was used and 1.2 equivalents of the NMO was used and 0.2 percent of osmium tetroxide we used and it led to 89 percent yield of the product and 94 percent enantiomeric purity. So uh, if we uh, start looking at various uh, ligands and various kind of uh, additives and then we see that the range, yield is ranging from 8 to 95 percent and the enantiomeric uh, purity is 20 to 88 percent. But then uh, use of osmium tetroxide has uh, decreased considerably and therefore 0.2 percent of osmium tetroxide is, is uh, needed for this particular kind of reaction. But then what are generally found that if we go from stoichiometric to catalytic process it leads to decrease in enantiomeric purity. So in general it was felt that uh, the enantiomeric purity is still in these cases uh, is not universally high in all the cases but it, it also needs to be uh, looked at it uh, from catalytic to stoichiometric fashion if one wants to uh, make it high enantiomerically pure product to be obtained. Now why is it that uh, when such a uh, low uh, enantiomeric purity is seen in cases uh, where NMO is used as a uh, co-oxidant. So it was uh, felt that this was due to the secondary catalytic cycle in which ligand was not involved. Now when uh, NMO is used as a reoxidant it converts osmium 6 glycolate of this type to osmium 8 glycolate along with the expulsion of the chiral ligand. That means when this osmium 6 intermediate is reoxidized with NMO it forms an osmium 8 glycolate but then ligand comes off. Now this osmium 8 glycolate which is devoid of chiral ligand then dihydroxylate some of the olefins and that leads to low enantioselectivity because the osmium 8 glycolate is uh, having osmium in uh, oxidation state of 8 it can uh, dihydroxylate some of the olefins and that would of course be of low enantioselectivity because chiral ligand is not present. But then when Sharpless used potassium ferricyanate, potassium carbonate, tertiary butanol water system in place of NMO the oxidant remains in water phase and this allowed this glycolate osmium 6 glycolate to get hydrolyzed like this and release the chiral diol which is of course of high enantioselectivity and of course then releases the osmium 6 which then gets reoxidized because the oxidant is soluble in water phase to osmium 8 which is osmium tetroxide. Now this osmium tetroxide then interacts with the chiral ligand and subsequently the uh, osmium 8 modified with the chiral ligand then reacts with the olefin and forms this type of osmium 6 intermediate and the reaction continues. Because of this in general it was found that enantio selectivity or enantiomeric excess of the diol with potassium ferricyanide, potassium carbonate, tertiary butanol water system uh, is much higher than just with NMO. What is the exact mechanism of this reaction? Initially what happens is that this osmium tetroxide gets uh, attached to the chiral ligand and uh, the modified 
Osmium uh, species then reacts with the olefin to form this osmium 6 glycolate having the chiral ligand. Now, this osmium 6 uh, glycolate then uh, gets oxidized with uh, uh, NMO, which is N methyl morpholine oxide, and releases NMM, that is N methyl morpholine. This osmium uh, 8 glycolate upon hydrolysis releases the chiral diol and the uh, osmium tetroxide. This entire cycle then of course continues and this would be of high enantio uh, selectivity because uh, the chiral ligand is attached to the osmium uh, tetroxide before it uh, dihydroxylates the uh, olefin. Now what happens is this particular osmium 8 glycolate which has been uh, uh, formed by the oxidation of osmium 6 glycolate oxidizes uh, some other olefins present in the reaction medium and then makes this particular osmium 6 species. Now this oxidation of uh, olefin by the osmium 8 glycolate is of low enantioselectivity selectivity because chiral ligand is not involved in this particular process. When this uh, osmium 6 species gets hydrolyzed, it releases the diol, but this diol will be of low enantioselectivity. purity. And so what needs to be done is of course this particular osmium 6 glycolate should get hydrolyzed to the chiral diol which will be of high enantio purity before it is uh, oxidized to this osmium 8 species because this is the osmium 8 species that is the culprit to oxidize the uh, olefins present in the reaction medium and there is a competition between the this uh, osmium uh, species with, uh, which has a ligand uh, and this particular osmium 8 species which doesn't have a ligand for the dihydroxylation of the olefin and because of this the uh, enantio selectivity of the chiral diol is low. So the modified reagent system of uh, potassium ferricyanide uh, introduced by Sharpless uh, takes care of this particular problem and allows the hydrolysis of this osmium 6 species to uh, the diol and the oxidant is present in the reaction medium and is soluble in water that oxidizes the released osmium 6 species directly to osmium tetroxide. That means in the modified system the hydrolysis is uh, taking place first to release the diol and subsequently uh, in the same medium the osmium 6 gets uh, oxidized to osmium 8 that is osmium tetroxide and therefore this primary cycle is uh, basically operating when potassium ferricyanide system is used and that is the reason why potassium ferricyanide based uh, system is of uh, high enantio uh, selectivity and gives the diol of uh, high enantio purity. So basically uh, four uh, the substantial developments were made, uh, the change of oxidant from NMO to uh, potassium ferricyanide uh, in water and tetrabutanol medium that led to the increase of the rate and of course they also introduced some new dimeric ligands uh, with uh, the same um, two alkaloids but as a spacer unit and a more convenient source of osmium tetroxide was used as this particular salt of the osmium tetroxide. So these are the structures of uh, various uh, spacers which have been used uh, and uh, this is the structure where thylazine is used as a spacer and uh, this is uh, DHQ and this is DHQD. This is another spacer here. Then you have uh, um, this type of uh, uh, spacer is used. Uh, which then allows two molecules to come in to the picture and then we have uh, this kind of pyridine, pyrimidine system as a spacer and this type of uh, spacers have been found to um, allow 
uh, a sort of pocket uh, of uh, chiral nature that allows the uh, oxy epoxidation, uh, the dioxylation to occur to give high enantiomatic purity. What is also uh, found that if one uh, takes uh, uh, the chiral uh, ligand uh, of any one of these type, say in this case thylazine is 5.52 grams and then 0.52 gram is that osmium salt and then potassium ferricyanide 700 grams and potassium carbonate is 294 gram. This particular combination of salts uh, is known as uh, AD mix alpha. And the uh, other one in which this is different uh, is known as AD mix beta. If we take a, a mixture of uh, these and uh, this we use only say 1.4 gram of AD mix uh, any one of them alpha or beta whichever one wants to use it per millimole of the olefin in tertiary butanol and water medium it is enough to give the dihydroxylation of high enantiomeric purity. So this has been introduced by a sharpless and therefore it is commercially available uh, with uh, chemical companies such as Aldrich and therefore one can simply buy these uh, particular uh, uh, mixture of uh, uh, an oxidizing agent and simply put 1.4 gram of it per millimole of olefin and get the dihydroxylation. What is a mnemonic device that has been uh, proposed by Sharpless based on a large uh, study of exa various examples is that if the olefin is uh, put it in this particular fashion where the small group and the large group and the medium and the hydrogen it is a tri substituted olefin if we can orient it in this particular fashion such that the small group is closer to the northwest side the large group is on the southwest side and the northeast side is having this uh, medium group and the smallest group is towards the southeast side. If we orient it then the epoxidation allows uh, the in such a fashion that you get the beta dihydroxylation uh, whereas uh, in, uh, in, uh, in cases uh, where AD mix alpha is used then you get the uh, dihydroxylation from the alpha side. So the AD mix alpha and AD mix beta are basically uh, designed based on such a uh, mnemonic device and therefore it is expected that if we put the olefin in this particular framework in this particular uh, uh, orientation then if we use AD mix beta the dihydroxylation will occur from the top phase and if we use AD mix alpha then the dihydroxylation will take place from the lower phase. Now it is uh, proposed that uh, the uh, reaction proceeds via this uh, four membered osma oxytane via 2 plus 2 cycloaddition whereas uh, it is also proposed that it goes via a 3 plus 2 uh, cycloaddition. Uh, and then uh, of course uh, eventually they come to this particular intermediate and then uh, the uh, reduction leads to the formation of the diol. This particular 3 plus 2 uh, proposition was made by Corey uh, on the basis of the fact that uh, this uh, 4 member ring could be sterically bulky whereas the 4 member intermediate was proposed by Sharpless. So uh, there is a controversy but then the results of course are, are the same uh, and you, one gets the diol uh, no matter what happens and we get the diol uh, through this uh, uh, expected uh, mnemonic device based uh, dihydroxylation. Now the low rate of reaction of tri substituted olefins as we discussed was due to slow hydrolysis of the osmium 6 glycolate and this is what the osmium 6 glycolate is and we saw that uh, the hydrolysis of it is, is a must before it undergoes uh, reoxidant, uh, reoxidation. Uh, but the hydrolysis was found to be increased by about 50 percent if uh, this uh, methyl sulfonamide is used and um, this allows 
the uh, hydrolysis to be fast and therefore the uh, enantiomeric purity is also affected by this. And uh, it um, also allowed uh, to do reactions at low temperature and therefore high stereoselectivity is, is observed. Surprisingly the terminal olefins uh, react slowly in the presence of uh, methyl sulfonamide and uh, this is something that is not very clear why is it so. However, uh, it is very clear that the addition of uh, methyl sulfonamide uh, is something that allows the uh, hydrolysis to be increased and uh, the molecules in which uh, the tri-substituted olefins were slow to hydrolyze could definitely be uh, improved and high uh, stereoselectivity is also observed. Now these are uh, some examples of the osmium tetroxide based reactions. For example, we can uh, take this uh, uh, epoxide having an olefin. Of course, this part of the uh, molecule can also be prepared. Uh, in fact, it has been prepared by using Sharpless epoxidation and the dihydroxylation was uh, carried out using this protocol uh, which we discussed just now. And of course, if we take no ligand, we get both the molecules and uh, the uh, uh, ratio is 1 is to 2. That means this uh, cis diol and this particular diol they uh, are both formed in 1 is to 2 if there is no ligand. If we use DHQ thalazine as this particular uh, reagent system then we get 10 is to 1 ratio and if we use DHQ DPHL then of course we get 1 is to 20 ratio of these two diol. So it is very clear that one can uh, choose uh, based on uh, what one wants and accordingly one can get the dihydroxylation. And one of these molecules was converted to castanospermine which is a, a good gly glycosidase inhibitor and uh, therefore it comprises of uh, a very important synthesis of uh, such a molecule which is uh, useful in biologically. We can also uh, uh, make, make an anti-cancer molecule as camptothecin uh, where this particular olefin was uh, dihydroxylated and as you can, can see that uh, the dihydroxylation leads to uh, the uh, formation as we can see from here. This part has to be hydrolyzed of course to go to this uh, particular amide and uh, the uh, double bond was dihydroxylated and as we can see from here that if we have dihydroxylation here taking place then we can get uh, this part I am not writing it. So this is what we will get it and uh, then with this iodine calcium carbonate this was oxidized to form the corresponding lactone. And this intermediate has been converted to the anti-cancer drug camptothecin. So one can uh, easily see that uh, how one can uh, make use of uh, such dihydroxylations in, in the synthesis of important molecules. So uh, uh, we will stop it uh, at this stage and uh, uh, we will uh, take up the uh, remaining aspects of uh, uh, asymmetric reactions, uh, especially the uh, reduction of uh, uh, molecules in such a way that they lead to optically pure reduced products. So uh, till then bye and thank you, we will see you next time.